um, really cool, uh, or a really cool article that Ken shared. And uh, we're going we're to go into one. We're going to go into a quick three-minute video as soon as we just little prefaces to the slide. So first, um, and I'll, I'll just read this with you. Most people in charge of shaping cities, the mayors, transportation planners, developers, and lawmakers, haven't realized what is about to hit them and the speed at which it is coming. They continue to build as if the future is like the present. Okay. This is someone who founded Zipcar, so they, she is already very grounded in kind of future thinking. So just to give you context on who's saying this. Uh, next one. Instead, cities and countries must actively shape the introduction of AVs, autonomous vehicles. So the autonomous vehicles are the car, are the, are the driverless vehicles that we have been hearing about for a number of uh, months, years. Um, for those of you who didn't see, Ford, Ford just announced today that by 2021, that's five years away, they're going to have a fully autonomous level four autonomous car in production. No steering wheel. No steering wheel. No steering wheel. Well, level four means full autonomy, I meaning there is no input from the driver. There is no driver other than the vehicle itself. Okay? Nissan said 2018 is their target. They're going to have a production ready level four autonomous vehicle by 2018. Lyft has uh, basically, or is it Lyft or Uber, had said that they were going to give Tesla a half a billion dollars um, and they'll take as many driverless cars, uh, autonomous cars as they can produce in 2020. GM trying to buy the. Yeah, GM made a half a billion dollar investment um, in uh, Lyft, Lyft yeah, right? Uber was the one that. And Uber was Lyft the one that, that, that basically told Tesla we'll take a half a million cars. Yeah, and they, they, they also have their own R&D with Carnegie Mellon and are trying to develop them themselves. So just keep, keep, that, keep that in mind. This is not science fiction anymore. I think a lot of people think it's science fiction still. Um, yes? Do, do, do the autonomous cars require infrastructure in place for the cities? So the question was, do autonomous cars require infrastructure? And I, I'm, I, I'm not an expert in, in that, so. Well, so uh, to quote Dr. Parkhauser, I just love him using his name, but when he was here, he said the most important things are good road signs and good paint on the road, right? I mean, those are the two most important things as far as their ability to see. Because they can see better than us. They've got a LiDAR for seeing far and seeing you know, very high resolution. They have radar for seeing other kinds of radar. They have ultrasonic, they have cameras. And they see 360 degrees. I'm going to have an interview uh, published in the next couple of weeks with uh, Danny Shapiro from NVIDIA. And he talks the biggest thing now is called sensor fusion. And it really is creating a human being in the sense that it has more inputs than we do. And, um, and it's all available today. And what's driving it is the video gaming that maybe a lot of us have made fun of. But that same I mean, video gaming is, is going into both the processing power as well as the simulation. There was a report a couple of months ago from, uh, I think it was Rand Corporation, saying you don't have enough time to test these cars to, to, to drive billions and billions of miles. Well, they are starting to test them via simulation. So these grand uh, auto theft and those kinds of games, those are actually, they're actually able to simulate driving better than they can in the real world. So, and as they do all this, it's all artificial intelligence learning and they're teaching themselves so you have this neural network of, of cars that learn and then they teach each other how to drive better so it's it's much better than driving instruction the instructor could do with the human i think um yes go. So, so the pain science that we number one there are sense there are sensor technology that go a little bit to autonomous cars but i will also like to add that um in the, when well, autonomous cars, the way I see it, in the long run, they are going to be better than human drivers. In the short term, they probably won't be. So when we talk about autonomous, the, the short term benefits, a lot of that is the same as shared vehicles. Right? So it's if they're drivers or not. Because we talk autonomous taxis, um, basically the same as autonomous cars. Autonomous drivers are transit vehicles, basically the same vehicles. Okay, so we're going to jump into that in just, just a second. Just one last, one last point before we move on. We will rent our own our we will we will rent our own housing that is 25 percent cheaper because it won't include parking. Um, and uh, there are a couple developed. I know Kathy uh, has is tied to the development community pretty tightly, um, and I think it's fair to say. And if I misstep, please correct me. But parking is a substantial part of building a building. Uh, it accounts for between 45 uh, to 50 thousand dollars per parking space, especially if it's underground, maybe more. Um, so, and, and if you have 1.7 parking spaces per unit, and you have 200 units, you've just put a lot of expense into building that building 
for the residents to have, I mean, someone's gonna pay, it's not the developer, they're just building. Someone's gonna have to pay for that. So the affordability, we wanna talk about affordable housing, real affordable housing, it's gonna embrace some of these ideas that are going to eliminate some of those, some of those requirements. Yes, sir. I, it's, it's a, it seems to me like a good concept, and it, and it may be true, but I immediately think about San Francisco, where you build buildings and they don't have parking, and it's extremely expensive. So it's it's not a single factor dynamic. There's a well, whole lot of factors, right? Sure. So uh, not saying that suddenly everything's going to be cheap, but the seventy-five thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars that would have gone into building a parking space for your unit could be invested into the affordability of that unit. That's all. It doesn't mean the unit's going to be cheap, but it's going to be potentially fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars cheaper than if you didn't have parking. What's that? To the developer, because the developer could also just add units on that land, right? Uh, so. Okay. I'm just talking about a net cost. How that cost gets applied is another discussion. But inherently, uh, parking adds, I guess the big message is parking adds cost to development. That's the, that's the big general message without getting into the specifics. Okay, so I'm going to go into a quick video. Uh, and it's, it's a fun video. Um, so hang on one second. Everyone's familiar with Zipcar, right? Oh, it's true. Maybe not everyone isn't. That's a good point. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a, a mini car sharing type service. It's like a rental car on demand type thing where you can just pick it up. On it. it might be on the street or on the curb. You pick it up. You know, there's a membership. You pick it up and you drive it. You drop it where you want to. And then maybe pick up another one. I don't know if I'm describing it. Do you have to drive it to a particular area when you, when you drop it off? You drop it off. Um, I, think, I think there are certain zones where you I mean, in, uh, in the city. That was one of the challenges this guy interviewed. He also worked at Zipcar. That was one of the challenges initially in the cities was getting the approval to drop it off in certain places on uh, But the idea is that you don't need to own the car because you can just, and I need it today, I don't need it. Or they have it at Stanford. Self driving cars. Yeah, they have it on campus. So A lot of colleges have it. So. Yeah. Uh, if I wanted to downtown San Jose, where would be? And there would be a parking lot that would just be dead here. Sustainable, yeah. equitable, and just. So, so a good point to ask, you know, what is Zipcar? Really briefly, like you said, it's having access to a vehicle without actually owning a vehicle. You pay like a membership and you pay to use it. So, you know, it's not just a flat fee. You pay per mile or something, something like that. But you can park it in other areas, other Zipcar parking lots, and they're strategically placed around the city, I think. Um, I'm not sure if Westfield is thinking about a zip car uh, solution at some point, but zip, a place like Westfield would be a good location for something like that well, to receive. Well, the other place that, 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 that I mean, all the new apartment communities are allocating space for this, and then it will just get more over time. And you think about when you talk about the cost of owning a car, somebody might make the choice instead of paying $200 an hour, uh, which is really what that number went to that you showed, even if it's the 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it starts to add up, it, it starts to make sense to just rent a car and maybe go to the grocery store or go shopping or whatever. Yeah. Walk so there from where you're, where you're the numbers there was we went to um, the state of the valley and there was there were some really good figures which we, we presented in one of the NAC meetings earlier this year. Um, really interesting how much you drive, how far you go, electric vehicles and electric bicycles, how they, that can actually augment that. But so this is just again just, just the new apartment communities are all going to have. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I think they continue to embrace it. Um, so this is again just a, a three minute, almost four minute video. Driving cars could make cities more livable, sustainable, equitable, and just. Fully automated self-driving cars will be available for sale in cities by 2020. They have very different economics than our current cars, and so won't fit in well with today's rules of play. I see two distinct possibilities for our automated car future, heaven or hell. We get to choose. Forward-thinking leadership is going to make all the difference. We get hell by taking a wait-and-see approach. In this future, people buy AVs instead of today's cars. For trips, once you get to your destination, instead of paying for parking downtown, it'll be cheaper to have your empty AV circle the block or drive back home. The same is true for stores. It could be cheaper to have a drugstore car drive to customers than to pay for retail space downtown. Today, 75% of all cars on the road have one occupant, the driver. In the future, as we add more cars operating with their different economics, 50% of the cars will have no people in them, running low-value errands or avoiding parking. 
Meanwhile, all the taxi, bus, shuttle, and truck drivers will lose their jobs. We'll also lose about 60% of our tax revenue that finances road infrastructure because AVs are electric, don't park, and don't get parking tickets. Our roads and bridges get a whole lot worse. We definitely don't want the hell scenario. We get heaven by taking a proactive approach. Over a million people in U.S. cities are already car sharing. And in San Francisco, 50% of the people using ride-hailing apps now share their trips with another passenger who's a stranger. Instead of spending $9,000 a year on your own car, when we combine car sharing and ride hailing and buy a seat in a shared autonomous vehicle, we can get door-to-door -door transport at the speed of private car travel for the cost of a subway ticket. This transforms people's access to opportunity. Car sharing eliminates the need for parking. Ride sharing reduces congestion. We will only need 10% of the cars we have in cities today, even at peak times. No more on-street parking, no more parking garages.